Welcome everyone to a really what promises to be an incredibly fun evening. I'm very excited about tonight. Um, lots and lots of people are with us and more still signing in, really looking forward to uh, a nice full house, which is an achievement when it's virtual because it's infinite. Um, I um, would like to first introduce myself. My name is Dahlia Mady. I'm the Chief Executive of Youth Alia Child Rescue. Um, Many of you have been with us for other virtual events that we've been holding uh, throughout the pandemic. Uh, and so thanks to those of you who are back with us again and welcome to those who are new to us. Um, Youth Alia Child Rescue is a charity that's been going since 1933. Um, we raise funds in the UK to support at-risk children in Israel, children who don't have a family who can safely take care of them. Uh, whether those children are orphaned, whether they are, come from abusive or neglectful homes, homes that are impacted by extreme poverty, violence, um, alcohol and drugs, um, uh, and, and many, uh, many children are also uh, impacted by the difficulties of, of immigration to a culture that is vastly different to where they've come from and that also impacts their family and their family's abilities to care for them. Um, what we have been doing since 1933 is providing those children a safe, uh, nurturing home where they learn, where they learn academics, but they also learn community they learn family and for many of them, they learn for the first time what it is to be taken care of by an adult, which is of course how we have all learned how to take care of our next generations and the people around us. So we're not only building a future for each individual child, we're also building a stronger society uh, for all of Israel. So that's what we do. The children uh, live in youth villages and we help to make sure that they have access to every opportunity to truly become the best that they can be, so that they can go on to become leaders in their own communities uh, and to perpetuate the cycle, not of poverty and violence, but the cycle of nurturing and learning and being contributing members of society. So that's what we do. Uh, all of your donations tonight that have paid for these tickets will go directly to supporting those children. Uh, any donations you choose to make uh, subsequently will also go directly to that. And um, thank you especially to Chris Tarrant for donating his time this evening, which means that essentially uh, we have no expenses. So anything that we raise from this will go directly to the children. So thank you all um, for that. Um, I want to give you a very brief update on one of the projects that we've been working really hard on for the past year. We uh, collectively, we, the community in, in the UK, have built an animal assisted therapy centre. This is where therapy is done uh, by trained therapists on uh, very, very um, traumatised children using animals. The children work with the animal of their choice, be it um, goats, ferrets, stick insects, chickens, ducks. Um, they find an animal that they can connect to and they use that animal to tell their own stories when they can't find the words to tell their own stories directly because it's too difficult for them. So we've built an amazing state-of-the-art center. Uh, it is now fully operational. The animals are in, the children are in and loving it. Uh, and it is being used now as a center of excellence and an example for other facilities around Israel that serve vulnerable children. And that is thanks to all of you. It was an incredible campaign to be a part of and I'm super proud of it and I can't wait to share more information and pictures about it. Um, let's get on with the evening's fun. Uh, a quick bit of housekeeping. I want to remind you that in this webinar format, um, even though you can see me and soon the others, we cannot see you. So you do not need to worry about whether your hair looks good. I, on the other hand, do, but we can't see you. Um, we can't hear you. So feel free to relax uh, and, and make comments to whoever's in the room with you. Um, at the bottom of your screen, if you move your mouse or if you're on a, a tablet, 
if you wiggle your finger or touch the screen, you'll see a Q&A box. At any time, you can click on that box and ask any questions that you have. Uh, just know that the, answer, the questions will be asked at the end of the presentation, at the end of the interview, um, but you can ask whatever questions you want. Know that I, if you put your name on it, I will say we have a question from you know Bob, uh, but if you want to, you can choose to make that anonymous. So just make it clear that it's an anonymous thing. The other thing is that we are recording tonight, which means that uh, folks will be able to watch this again on, uh, on our website when it is done. Um, with no further ado, I want to introduce a volunteer extraordinaire uh, and chairman of our events committee, Morris Selwyn, who has um, been incredible in putting together so many events over the last months and more than a year now. So um, Morris himself has an incredible history as a musician uh, and general volunteer and fabulous guy. So uh, Morris, please join us. I'm going to sign off uh, and I will see you all later. Have a great time, Morris. Okay, brilliant. Well, fabulous. I mean, thank you so much, Dahlia. Uh, good evening to you all uh, tonight. My guest is someone who genuinely requires little in the way of introduction. His face is instantly recognizable and his voice easily identified as soon as you hear it. Now you may think uh, because, because of this, you know him, uh, but I'm confident that after this interview, you will know a great deal more about this most interesting man and his remarkable career. So let's get it on as they say on TV and welcome the amazing Chris Tarrant, OBE. <laughs> Hi, mate. How nice to be amazing. I don't know what's amazing about me, Morris, but bless you, thank you very much. Thank Great you for making you. me so welcome. And um, it should be a lovely night for what is very much a, a charity to all our hearts. It's a great Indeed. charity and God bless you all and thank you for what you do. Well, thank you. I've got to say, Chris, to start, I mean, what an honour it is uh, for us to have you join us tonight. And we are indeed most grateful for your time. So I'm going to go right back to the very beginning. And I'm going to say, Christopher John Tarrant, you were born on the 10th of October, 1946 to Basil and Joan. Now tell us a little bit about your family. Um, it was a very normal, happy childhood, really. I mean, we weren't rich, we weren't poor. Um, dad sort of, well, dad, dad was obviously before I was born, he, he, he fought in France and on into Germany from 39 to 45. So I was born just after the war. It was quite weird. I mean, I didn't really suss it at all, but when I grew up, for, I mean, really, as soon as I could sort of see and comprehend anything, my house was full of soldiers who'd come back from the war or whatever. And it was only when I was about, I suppose, probably about eight, that I realized that although the talk was all in our kitchen or wherever they, the, the men assembled about the war, the ones who gave it all that, oh, uh, you know, home fit for heroes and the skies were black with the Luftwaffe and without men like me, you know, you, you kids would never have been born. Most of those had never, ever been anywhere more dangerous than Bournemouth. And the real hardcore, like my dad, his brother John, who fought in Burma, um, several of dad's sort of hardcore mates, they're the ones who saw the real horrific action, the real bad stuff and lost a lot of friends and great colleagues, you know, along the way and saw horrors that, you and I couldn't really comprehend. Um, and they hardly talked about it at all. Dad was very chatty, very funny. Um, he talked a lot about, you know, the silliness of the military and nonsense and, and things like that. But if I, if I analyze it, he very rarely talked about the war. And years later, um, sadly after dad's death, I actually wrote a book about dad's war, mainly just putting together all sorts of bits and pieces that I found out from everybody except my father who just wouldn't talk about it. And I don't think, I mean, it was called Dad's War, and it was it was a big seller. But I just wanted to get it out there um, well, because I love the man. We're going to cover that a lot more. Today. My best friend. Yeah. Um, but it was just, it was quite a weird, weird childhood, and the the place was full of references to something that that had finished, but the knock on went on for years. I went to quite a nice little sort of quite a funny little private school. My parents then, I mean, they didn't have a lot of money, but they really scrimped and saved. I think a lot, a lot of parents did then to send me off to uh, a boarding school, probably just to get rid of me packed me off to, to Worcester for four years. Um, I then went to university in Birmingham and I spent a lot of the early part of my, my life and my career uh, in the Midlands. 
and I'm sort of, I am actually a sort of honorary Brummie when I go up there and talk, I talk most peculiar because I lived up there for a very long time. And a lot of the locals actually in Birmingham think I, you know, think I was born there, which I'm not, I'm, I was born in Reading. But I had a happy child and a lovely mum and dad and I, I miss them both hugely. Of course you do. Uh, I know at school you attained some, some A-levels. You got A-levels in English, history and ancient history. Yes. Uh, I mean, that obviously put you in good stead for being a DJ and a TV. Yeah, exactly. Whatever was I doing? It's like all the years I did Latin till I was about 16. And I kept saying, sir, what is the point of this? And he said, one day, Tarrant, you'll thank me for this. Well, I'm 75 now and I still have no idea why I did it. Absolute waste of my time. As was algebra. Did you ever do algebra? What was that all about? Well, I did algebra. In fact, I said the same thing to one of our teachers. What is the point? I said, I have never, ever been to a country where they speak algebra. No, What's you won't. <laughs> well, um, and, oh, what were they? Logarithms. What were they? But, you know, uh, I I, yeah, I had a strange, a strange school. Yeah. But, um, I think it was all right. I was a boarder. I, was, I wasn't very happy there. I seem to get caned all the time, which you, I talk to my kids now about caning and they go, Dad, that's brutal. That's horrific, which probably it was. But at the time, we just got caned. And I would, all rather, I would always rather get caned than sort of get detention or, I mean, you know, we used to get, because we were boarders, they could lock us up for three weeks and all that. So I would always, or, always rather take the short, sharp shock on my left buttock, you know, four or six of the best. Award. One time I got caned 12, 12 times. Um, and it didn't do me any good at all, but I'd rather do that than, you know, be, be detained for weeks and I couldn't play sport, I couldn't, couldn't go out and chase girls or whatever. I think nowadays, if you talk to kids about Kane, they think of uh, Harry, the number nine for Spurs and for England. Yeah, not even Michael, most of them don't remember Michael. Absolutely. Now, listen, you were a bit of a sportsman, that I do know. Yes, so what, I, was, um, what I did, did you... a lot of rugby, I was good at rugby. Um, I was best at cricket, I love cricket, I still do love cricket. I've sort of just about stopped playing now because if I'm, if I'm really truthful, I'm just, I'm just not very good anymore. I was quite good. Um, I played for Birmingham University. My son is better. My son is very, very fast, um, scarily fast. And he, if I go and, you know, have a practice with him, he can, come on, Dad, dance to the chin music, which means the ball just goes past the edge of your chin or taste the leather. And Daddy doesn't want to taste the leather. Thank you, Toby, my boy. He's very good. He's a nice lad, actually. He took, okay. That's going to kill me. We're going to talk about cricket uh, a little bit further down the line. Uh, but having turned down a place at Oxford, uh, you went on to read English at Birmingham University. Yeah, so I... What did you do after graduation? Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't really wait. I, um, I didn't want to sort of... You had to wait a year to get to Oxford, and I didn't really see it as, as any big deal. I thought it's just... Another, to me, it was just another university, and I wanted to do, do the university bit, you know, get into it and enjoy it. And I didn't want to hang around for 12 months. I honestly think if I'd done the gap year, I wouldn't have gone. I'd have just, you know, lost myself somewhere. Um, so now I turned down the chance to go to Oxford another year's time and I went to Birmingham. I had a fantastic time. I didn't learn much, but I had a brilliant time. I, was, I suppose after, after four years of boarding, I was sort of, you know, becoming a very young, silly man. I was actually, I was reading some stuff about myself the other day. I was actually, I think I was probably quietly deranged when I was sort of 18 to about 22. Some would say I still am, but I, I think I was a very odd, I've got a nice man, but I think it was quite odd. Well, well speaking of a young man, because we, we've got a photo here of you, okay. um, from taken from around that time. <laughs> I'm so pretty. Yeah, now I want to know, did you always dream of working in television? And uh, how, no. How, and I, oh, ask the question, no. because I, I want to know, how did you kickstart your career? And in my mind, knowing what I now know about you, uh, the word chutzpah comes to mind. The word what? Chutzpah. Well, sort of bluffspah, really. That is the most ridiculous photo. I have no idea. I think I was on telly by then. Oh, God knows. Look at my hair. The other yeah. thing I have was those dreadful, look at those ginger sideboards. I wore those for time. years. Though. And everybody used to tell me how awful they looked. And I went, no, 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 I look great. I must admit now they were right. I look ridiculous. I am. Um, I did various jobs like we all do. I did night security man and, you know, various lorry driving and stuff. Um, and I remember one day I was doing a job up in Kenilworth at the Royal Showgrounds. And I saw some bloke arrive in a flash sports car with a very nice lady on his arm, on his passenger seat. 
um, pulled up his car, combed his hair, gave her a kiss, blew a kiss to himself, I think, in the mirror. And he went out and he did a couple of interviews with a couple of blokes with prize bulls or whatever. It was a sort of agricultural event. Um, he did a couple of bits to camera, sort of about and here I am at and that was it from and all that. And, I, and he was back in the car about you know, about 40 minutes. And I thought, and, you know, he was away while, the, while his camera crew sort of spent another half hour packing up all the gear and probably got caught in the rush hour. And I remember thinking, that doesn't look like much of a job to me, but, you know, not, not a bad day's work at all. Uh, and I sort of dismissed it for a long time, but, but I think always in the back of my brain, I thought, that doesn't look very difficult, which, of course, if, if, if I'm honest, it isn't. Um, and it then became sort of, really, that became my career, incidentally, or whatever, for about the next, well, eventually 50 years of my life. So I, I wrote this awful cringe-making letter, which I still, I still shudder to, my dad thought I'd actually lost the plot completely. Um, and it was a dreadful sort of Muhammad Ali brash letter saying, it was something like, it included the, I, I am honest, I'm industrious, I'm this, that and the other. Um, but but it, I just remember this phrase, I am the face of the seventies and this is your chance to snap me up. And I, I think about this, I can't actually believe that I wrote it. I wrote it on my dad's typewriter with two fingers. Uh, I don't think I even did like, you know, copies. So I wrote it out to 22 times or whatever. And I sent it to every single television company in, in the UK. Now there weren't anything like the number of satellite stations or whatever that there are now, but there was still a huge amount. All the local BBC stations and, and you know, then it was London Weekend, it was ATV in Birmingham, it was Yorkshire Television, Tyne T, Scottish, Westwood, all these people. 99% um, or 98% of them had the very good sense to say, well, well they, didn't, they, didn't actually, they don't actually turn you down. They say, dear sir, stroke madam, thank you so much for your letter, which we all read with great interest. Um, unfortunately, we have no vacancy um, for you at this moment, but trust, we will keep uh, your letter on file. Now, now, trust me, kids wanting to go on to, you know, get into the media or whatever, there is no file. The file is the waste paper bin. I never heard from any single one of those people ever, ever, ever again. Um, but ATV Birmingham and Yorkshire Television in Leeds uh, both invited me up for an interview. I think they just wanted to know <laughs> what sort of a weirdo wrote this letter. Um, but whatever I, whatever I was on that day, um, or whatever they were on that day, I seem to impress them both. So Leeds offered me a sort of tenuous job sometime to start in the next few months. Uh, and ATV Birmingham offered me a job on their local news calendar, ATV Today, um, the six o'clock show, to start as soon as I could. Well, now, this was October. I was living then with my wife down in, in Weymouth in Dorset. Um, which is a lovely part of the world. It's particularly lovely in the winter. It's also lovely because it's very close to the River Dorset Stour, which then was some of the best, best fishing in England. And I was just fishing. I had enough money sort of saved up from the summer. We were going out every night and I was fishing most days. Um, so I said to them, I'd love to come as soon as possible. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just finishing off this screenplay. Now, there was no screenplay. Of course there wasn't. Nobody said to me, by the way, Chris, what is the screenplay? Um, I mean, I find it quite, quite shocking really now that I just kept putting them off and putting them off and just because I just wanted to go fishing all the time. And if you look at my first ever contract with ATV, the first, first day's work I ever did uh, in television, it, I actually, the, what you need to know is that the fishing season closes on the rivers on the 14th of March. And guess what day my first day in television was? the 15th of March, 1972. I mean, that is quite shocking because it's like everything that happened afterwards and you know, the lifestyle I've had and the lifestyle my kids have had and the, the fun I've had and the enjoyment I've had and the driven you know, career enthusiasm that I've had. I could have just said, oh, I can't be bothered going fishing. and Because they would soon have said, look, I don't care whether you finish your screenplay or not, we've got to give this job to somebody else. So I'm still quite, um, well, embarrassed really by the fact I nearly turned the job down because from that everything else came over the next few years. Well, in respect of that, because in 1974, ATV wanted you to develop a new children's show 
uh, which you were invited to co-host. And we've got a screenshot of this. Oh, yeah. Yes, it was. Now then, tis was. Now, I've got a question for you and a question okay. for a lot of our listeners and viewers. Can you remember what tis was was an acronym for? Yes. Sat uh, today is Saturday. Watch and smile. That's it. Because basically saying sat Saturday is, is today is Saturday. Watch and smile is too long. So it became Saturday's Tis Wars Day. Um, it was huge. Yeah. Lots. I mean, it started as a small Saturday morning thing, very cheap production. Um, and it just went through the roof. I think nobody had anything like it. Some quite a lot of channels didn't open at all on Saturday mornings till about 12, 12 noon. So they didn't realize this sort of tremendous commercial possibilities of the Saturday morning. Channel, various stations did not open till 12 noon or even one o'clock on a Saturday afternoon for World of Sport or something. Um, and we started the whole Saturday morning thing. And I mean, in some ways it was just convenient for parents because they used to take their kids to, I mean, quite awful Saturday morning pictures in town with real cheapo, you know, the Cisco kid and Hopalong Cassidy and just not three stooges and cartoons and things. So it would mean whether you want to watch it or not, that you could stuff your kids in front of the television at nine o'clock on a Saturday morning and didn't really worry about them at all until, you know, 12, half past 12. Um, so initially it was that and a huge kids audience because there was nothing for them. So they started filling in postcards for our competitions, all that. And then slowly the, the mums and dads started to sit down with the kids. But then by the end of it, the kids actually had gone in the other room to watch something else. Um, and and it, I mean, it did get this huge adult cult. Um, we did it. We did road shows after about three years. We did the sort of four bucketeers on the road, which is an absolute riot. I mean, literally a riot every night with buckets of water and hoses going over the audience. And I remember women coming running up to me going, Chris, Chris, I paid five pounds for this ticket and I'm still dry. Oh, don't worry, mother. Shh, all that. Uh, I mean, it was a riot. Um, and we had on the ticket, bear in mind this was a spin-off from a children's television programme, we had on the ticket no one under the age of 18 allowed in the auditorium. Because it had something like eventually, about three or four years in, it had something like a 56% of the audience were over 18, which was great. But it also meant, as the producer eventually, I, I, I started off writing and presenting it, and after about three years I produced it as well, so it, it took over my whole life. Um, and it was kind of difficult to know what you were aiming, what audience you were aiming at. Whatever. And I think in the end, we just did things that made us laugh because we were just big kids anyway. Where, where did the creative ideas come from for this? Uh, the bar and ATV mainly on a Friday evening. That's where most of our scripts were written. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, once we got into it, then you just thought about Tiswas all the time. In, in your brain, it was always great show, great idea. That didn't work. Um, what should we do next week? We were always trying to better it. And, you know, we ran, I think, about 10 months a year every Saturday morning live. Um, I mean, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And, and slowly, this ridiculous but wonderful cast of characters came in, you know, like Lenny Henry joined us, Sam oh, James joined we'll us. Talk about those because you've got, uh, you had a very young Lenny Henry, yeah. uh, Jim Davidson, you had uh, John Gorman, uh, who was from the Scaffold Pop Group. But then you also had these two amazing characters. Oh, yeah. Bob and Spit. <laughs> yeah. Now, this is typical of what you could actually do on Tis Watch. Frank Carson brought Bob Carroll G's along one morning. I'd never seen him before. He just said, it's a mate of mine, come down just watch, to watch the show. And I said, all right, mate, just stand there quietly out the back. So he stood there with his kids. And while I was doing a link at the front, all the kids started giggling and howling with laughter. And I thought, well, I don't remember being that funny. Um, and what it was, was this guy, this man you're looking at, um, was doing all sorts of stuff behind my head with this dog. And he then produced a monkey called Charlie who did tricks with blowing up balloons and stuff. And kids were howling with laughter. And during the break, I said, do you want to do that again when we come out of the break? He said, yeah, sure, I'd love to. So we did it all again. And from that, just literally turning up as, a, as an unwelcome, well, un unbooked anyway, guest of Frank Carson. I mean, Bob was on the show every day for the next every Saturday for about the next four years. That dog, we, I did a thing up in Liverpool last year and I didn't know Bob was coming. And that dog just walked in and started doing the spitting and you know moving its head around. It, it's a wonderful puppy. I mean, it really is almost like, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the good ones are, but it's almost human. It's quite bizarre. And then I started getting complaints from women saying, um, 
my little boy cleans his teeth and now spits over the side of the basin. You know, and I went, it's not my fault. Your mummy, you tell little boy he can't spit over the side of the basin. He's got to spit in the basin. It's very popular and, and very funny. I mean, he had, the, he had the dog, he had Charlie the monkey. And after about two years, hugely successful. And we were sending out thousands of tis, uh, spit t-shirts, spit puppets and all this stuff. Um, we used to take him to the live shows and Spit would do a sort of 20 minute Spit song and God knows what. Very popular, good fun. And I said to him, Bob, it's all good. Well, you know, it's all good. The monkey's funny, Spit's huge. We've got to come up with something else. He said, okay, trust me, trust me. I'll come up with something else. Next week, I'll bring something in. So, <laughs> and it was the way Tiswell sort of worked. It was sort of bat baptism of fire. Um, <laughs> we, like Spit came on once and he was on, you know, every week for the next four years. Charlie the monkey was on for three or four years. He brought in this thing called Cough the Cat. And you won't remember it because it lasted one week. This dreadful blue cat. And I said, Bob, it's not very impressive. Said, no, it's great. You wait, you wait. And I said, what is it doing? It goes, heh, heh. Oh, he said it. He went, yeah, it's great. And it went, no. He said, every child in Britain will be going, heh, heh. Oh, no, Bob, they really won't. And we just sort of dumped it. And Cough the Cat came and went in. Well, less than one commercial break, I think. But what was great about that is the sort of show where you could try things, think that's a great idea, we'll run with that, or that was a ridiculous idea. Let's even forget, hope everybody forgets that ever happened. Great days, this was. Okay, well, you had another guest on there, and there's a great story about this guy, and we've got um, a picture of him coming up now. Oh, Carrot. Carrot, yes, because yeah. I don't know whether many of our guests will know uh, but just the carrot, actually, uh, one had a featured routine which was listed by the Royal Society for the Prevention of Accidents. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to tell us about that? Well, he, he, came, he was a lot to do with the early years of Tiswatch. So he obviously lived locally and he and I knew each other very well. So he'd occasionally come on the show. He'd also just sometimes come in and write ideas for us for which we paid him and, you know, come one or two silly monologues or whatever. Um, and we were sitting there having lunch one week after we'd done a show. And I said, yeah, it's all right. It's going really well. But I need, I don't know, something new to do. We're always looking for something new the next. And he said, well, you could do the dying fly if you like. And I went, yeah, we could do it. Oh, they'd love it. They'd love the dying fly. Of course, it used to be called dead ants. But it's dying fly now. People love the dying. And I went, it's lovely, Jasper. Um, what exactly is it? And he said, well, I'll show you. How. And he got up on the table, lay on his back with his little arms and legs kicking like that. And he basically, I can't do it myself because I'm not on my furniture. Um, and he used to do this sort of bizarre kicking legs thing to, to some sort of strange music. And it became the dying fly. Now, we tried it the next week again in the studio. When we opened, we had all the kids, all the mums and dads, me, Sally, Lenny, everybody lying on our backs, kicking our legs, whatever. And again, it just became huge. And all around the country, I was judging dying fly contests and things like that. I mean, how the hell do you judge somebody upside down? You couldn't even see their faces. It was very funny. It lasted for a couple of years. And then, as you say, um, it, it was people were getting sillier doing it. And, you know, they were coming out of pubs doing it and all that and lying on the middle of pavement and things. And then two blokes uh, in Cardiff, um, the worst for fine Welsh beer, came out of a pub one night late and lay on a dual carriageway in Cardiff and were very near. They weren't, but they were very nearly killed. And Rosper said, this is going to cause more accidents, whatever. So we became, I think, we were just behind. Number six that year was people, oh, that's right. Number six was people who throw buckets of water onto their Christmas tree. Don't ask why people do that, uh, to put candles. I'd no idea. And then we were number seven, the dying fly. A bit, you know, beyond, ahead of that was drink driving and stuff, and behind it was God knows what. So, yeah, we were. But Jasper then, when I did my, well, they did my, this is your life a few years later with Michael Aspel. Jasper came on and to his credit, and actually to everybody's credit, he got us all on our backs doing the dying flies, the sort of final music, you know, the credits or whatever of, of this is your life. And Michael Aspel, bless him, still with the red book under his arm, lying on his back, managed to somehow spring into an upright position, get hold of me somehow and sort of vaguely upright and hold the red book and go, Chris Tarrant, this is your life. Um, so the dying fly became a legend in many ways. I don't think Mike Aspel could do that now, but he was incredibly athletic at the time. We were all very impressed. You think you were? Silly days. Well, splendid days, but silly days. 
Well, Tidsworth came off the air in 1981. Yeah. And a year later, you hosted um, a Saturday night adult version. Yeah. And that was called... OTT. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what was, I mean, tell us how that word goes from a, a, an alleged kids show into a, an adult version. Well, we wanted to move on from the kids thing. Uh, you know, I didn't want to be labelled a children's entertainer, which I, I never really was. Um, and also, I was, it sounds ridiculous, it probably is. I was fed up with custard. I smelt of custard. My kids smelt of custard. My wife smelt of custard. My car smelt of custard. I just wanted to move on. So we went into some late night adult, some of it quite very adult, risque humour. Um, some of it was, some of it actually looking back, and it was all live, you know, rehearsed, but live. Um, some of it was actually brilliant. Some of it was truly dreadful because you do a first series, it's very much a, you know, finding our way, towing our way gently. I mean, I had people, we had some great bands on like Human League and Ian Gellin and all sorts of people, but we also had, um, you know, comedians as varied as Alexis Sale, um, Oh, and Bernard Manning. So we were always going to be in trouble one way or another. And I was producing it. So I, I did the show every Saturday night. And then every Monday morning, I'd be wheeled in before the controller and kicked around the office for about three hours. And then you did this and then you said that and whatever. Um, it was quite weird because, I mean, he and I had actually got on well for years and I liked him and I still like him. But he sort of, you sort of realise that People's taste, there are levels you think that is actually unacceptable, that is disgusting, and we all agree with that. But there are other levels you think, I think that was really good and entertaining and funny. And he would say that was awful and degrading and horrible. We did a spoof, it was one of those periods where um, there were lots of streaker stories. There was a streaker at Twickenham, there was a streaker at one of the football matches, whatever. Um, and I thought, wouldn't it be jolly good fun to have a streaker at a snooker match? So unbeknownst to the audience, Lenny Henry was doing a commentary about he's looking for the black ball and lining up the blue and all this. Um, and suddenly this beautiful, and she was a stunning girl, jumped on the table with no clothes on, ran across it sort of, you know, very, um, I don't know, uh, vivaciously and jumped off the other end and put Matt around and she disappeared. Now, I thought that was incredibly funny. It was, she was very, very good. It was, very, it was actually very tasteful. Um, and completely unexpected, the audience was screaming with laughter. But on the Monday morning, he said, that's it, you finally done it. And he really lost the plot. I thought he was going to shoot me. If he had a gun, he might have done it. Um, and I said, Charlie, you're wrong, mate. That was very good. And I don't know, we went through that every week. So we, we did that every week for 13 weeks. I really enjoyed it. I, ex I expected to do a second series, but we had so much flack that they kind of, they kind of went against ratings, which television companies, you know, don't often do, because they were getting so much, all sorts of strange people were coming out of the woodwork. I was, there was a, there was a vicar in Birmingham who after the first show, he said, my children, one of these sort of evangelical children, my children, I'm not going to preach my no normal sermon today. Will you all, all get down and put your hands together and pray that ATV television take off that disgusting OTT that started last night at midnight. Uh, it was a bit extreme. The Sun wrote, when will OTT be OFF? You know, it was quite clever for them. Um, I don't know. I, I enjoyed it. it. It was midnight. I mean, I had, I had letters saying, you know, I, I was so disgusted, I sent my five-year-old daughter to bed. Well, I'm sorry, madam. She should have been in bed at, you know, eight o'clock. We had a lot of hypocrisy. I don't mind people saying that was just not funny or that was, you know, not very well acted or whatever. But people saying, oh, that was a bit tasteless. No, it wasn't. Most of it was fine. I look. I actually. Look, I was talking to Ben Elton about this. I actually look look back on it with great great fondness. And Lenny Henry, going from being a big gangling young boy on Tiswas, became a man on OTT. He absolutely grew in stature. Everything I asked him to do, he did it better and better week after week. You know, um, he was he, he he is. But he was such an all round talent. You know, he could. He could do stand up, he could sing, he could dance, he was funny. Uh, you know, he was good looking, the women liked him. He was an amazing man. It was the first time we really glimpsed how big an entertainer he was. Before that, I think he was just one of this gang with me and Sally and Spit and the rest of us. Good days.
Well, in 1984, uh, a change of career, really, because you, you took up residence on this radio station. Now, God, my hair. Yes. God, uh, look at that. You present. It's like I've been electrocuted. Whatever. <laughs> it's like a little hat. Good grief. That's a great picture. Yeah. Well, I don't know, great picture. Funny picture. The, uh, um, yeah, I did. I, I never intended to do radio. I didn't understand radio. And I, I actually resisted radio for quite a long time. I was I was doing a book. Um, I think one of the first ones I, I wrote about various, you know, adventures I'd had on OTT and Tiswas and stuff. And I was obviously wheeled into various radio stations to plug it. Um, and I went to Radio Coventry. They asked me to do a Christmas special. So I sort of, I could choose 12, 12 records that I liked and then chat a bit about my book in between them and all that. So I made quite a nice, quite a nice sort of hours television, uh, radio, radio, hush my voice. Um, and unbeknown to me, Coventry then syndicated. So I went out on various commercial stations all over the UK at Christmas. And one of the, one of the companies was a place called Capital Radio in London, which I really had no knowledge of because I lived in the Midlands. I worked in the Midlands. My local DJ was a guy called Les Ross on BRMB in Birmingham, who was absolutely brilliant in the mornings, truly wonderful. Um, I knew Kenny Everett because he lived quite close to me and I did know Michael Aspel, but I didn't know much about Capital at all. So they said, they rang me up after Christmas, rang my agent, and they said, would Chris like to do some radio? And he rang me. I said, no, I don't understand radio. I do telly. I've got quite a lot of telly booked for the rest of the year. I'm just not interested. Um, and they came back again. What about if you just came down and did a pilot? And after much sort of whinging, I went, mm, I can't do a pilot. And I did a pilot, just me going and chatting with a pile of records, that, you know, music that I liked. And I thought, this is actually quite fun, this. Um, and again, I sort of, you know, resisted it. I mean, I, and I wasn't being tactical. I really, I didn't feel confident in doing radio. Um, anyway, eventually they, they offered me quite a lot of money and they said, you know, you only need to do one Sunday every week and this, that, and the other, you know, you, once a week on a Sunday is the only thing you have to do. For, and I did this thing called Lundy Sunshine, um, which I think the funniest thing was the title, actually. It wasn't, it wasn't brilliant to be honest, looking back now, but it was, for me, I was beginning to learn the ropes of radio. And then they switched me across to a mid-morning show. And then after about two years, yes, about two years, 86, 87 probably, I started doing the Capital Breakfast Show, which I just loved. And I did that for the next 17 years. So I must've quite liked it. 17 years of, somebody once worked out how many breakfast shows I've done, I forget now. Oh, well, now I'm gonna ask you that because I know how many shows you've done. Yeah, and you're very clever, aren't you? <laughs> Yeah, if you know the value of the prizes over those 17 years that you gave away. Well, I, of course I don't, but also I don't. How many, how many shows do you reckon I did? Well, how many shows do you reckon you did? I think it's 4,000 something. Yes, 4,424 shows. And at five o'clock Revali every morning, even though sometimes I'd only got in about quarter to five. Um, and I mean, I was only late four times and I think that's quite good actually, I mean, one of them was absolutely entirely my fault because I was drinking with Terry Wogan, who was sabotaging me. Um, once I had a car breakdown, I, I forget what the other two were, but four in, in that many is not bad. Uh, I loved it. I mean, sometimes I just felt, and the thing with radio, I mean, you can just fall in feeling like death and just say, hello, good morning, five past six, press a record. Three minutes later, if you still don't really feel like talking much, go, and here's another record. And you just gently wake up and you read the papers and you make it up. And I loved it. And I mean, again, a bit like Tiz was, I suppose. You could have a, what I loved about radio, it was so instant. You could have a good idea in the car coming in and you could do it on the radio live in front of, you know, two million people or whatever, about quarter past six. And by 20 past six, think, well, that was a stupid idea. I don't know why I did that. Or think, that's great, we'll do that again tomorrow. Um, I loved it. I thrived on it. I absolutely, I just enjoyed it. and I. I mean, even now, looking back, the, if people ever say to me, what was the best fun? It's definitely Capital Radio. I had so many laughs with so many mates and, you know, ridiculous callers and things. I mean, it, it was a buzz. And I think, I mean, one of the things about breakfast, breakfast DJs, I mean, there's quite a bond between us because none of us like getting out of bed. So there, there is a sort of bond between most of them, actually. Um, and they all know each other and listen to what the other one does and whatever. And what you want to be, you want to be first. You want to be first to tell your audience. And, and it's not just the silly things, you know. I mean, yes, you want, to, you want to be the first to tell your audience, 
Overnight, while you've been asleep, Freddie Starr ate somebody's hamster in a sandwich. You want to be the first to tell them that. There's a woman in Wolverhampton who's been abducted by aliens who impregnated her and put her back on her lawn. Now, if her husband believed that, they deserve each other. There were, there were stories like that, but there were also, um, I mean, I remember the morning of the famous hurricane when all the trees in Southern England were flattened and whatever. And I looked out of my window, it's like, oh, I mean, I couldn't believe what, what happened since I went to bed. And just outside my, my front door in North London, trees were flattened. We had to drive round trees on the road, trying to get in. I remember there was a, there was a very nice Porsche uh, in Finchley High Road, and there was a massive, I don't know, beach tree around me, right across it. And I thought, that bloke is probably lying in bed next to his girlfriend, very, very happy, looking yeah. forward to getting up and going to work at his, his Porsche. He has no idea what's happened during the night. Um, so there were things like that you wanted to tell people. And then there were, I mean, awful sad things happen as well, that you're the first to communicate with the world. So I remember one morning we went on air and they were still bringing the bodies out of King's Cross Station. Remember the famous horrific King's Cross fire, you know? Mm -hmm. And you also, you would have to adjust your, your package. You wouldn't be, you know, immediately irreverent and daft and you had to watch re what records you were playing and stuff. And I mean, the biggest one of all, people went to bed and when they woke up, we had to say, unbelievably, during the course of the night, Princess Diana has died in a tunnel in France. And that was the most bizarre, weird week of, of every radio presenter's life because you couldn't do anything. It was Radio was a kind of therapy that week. I mean, we got some sort of award somewhere for how we handled, you know, that awful week that followed the death of Diana because all competitions were cancelled. We really had to look very carefully at what records we were playing. Certain records got huge prominence, like Marvin Gaye's What's Going On, uh, Michael Jackson's Gone Too Soon, obviously Elton with Candle in the Wind. You know, there were other records we said, you can't play that this week. And people were just ringing up. And I mean, grown men were just crying. Big burly taxi drivers are crying on the phone. And it was, it was very tough. I mean, you come off air at 10 o'clock, absolutely worn out. From six o'clock, you're just sort of doing a, you know, a phone in with, with terribly unhappy. I mean, that, that beautiful lady touched all our lives. We knew her well because she was the patron of our Help a London Child charity for several years. So she came in the studios once in a while. She was good fun. And it was tragic. And then on Saturday morning, we had to do the warm up sort of before we went across to television at 10 o'clock. We did the warm up on radio uh, for the funeral. And I'd never thought I'd do a radio, you know, radio warm up for a funeral in my life. It was an extraordinary, tragic week. And all the things that happened, like, are the royal family ever going to appear? Do they realize how many flowers there are outside the gate? Where are they, royals? And the anguish of the, you know, and the funeral itself with the two little boys walking along with their grandfather and Elton on the piano and extraordinary speech by Lord Althorpe and all that. I mean, it was just an amazing seven days. And we started that on the Monday morning saying, we can't believe what I'm going to tell you's happened, but, but it's just awful. So, and even that in a way is kind of, I don't know, it's memorable. You know, you can't forget it. I mean, I'll never forget that week. And then the next week you get back to something like normality because everybody wants to get back to normal, like the world doesn't know, desperately trying to get back to normal after the pandemic. We wanted to get back to some sort of normality after the loss of dear Diana. Extraordinary, mm. extraordinary week. You mentioned Diana and the, <clears throat> and the global charity of Help a London Child. And then of course that, that, that transposed itself into uh, Make Some Noise. Yeah, it's what it is now. Well, yeah. my son's there now and he makes more noise than his dad did. So, Indeed. hello. Oh. Yes, there we are. Let's make some noise. That's right, on the subject of make some noise, I mean, I've been to the um, Global Place twice and uh, with my, my rock and roll band, The Brickets, yeah. uh, we played there on the roof. And then we did, did, I also did a second stint with some of the Bay City Rollers there uh, for the second year. And that was it's quite something. It's a great charity. It helps so many different charities. Yeah, it does. And it's a great thing. But you're, you mentioned your son. And um, I know that um, both your children are working in radio, uh, Toby and Fear. Yeah. Uh, did you give them some advice? Not really, because you can't, you know. Um, I mean, you actually can't. I just said to enjoy it, you know, enjoy it, because you will enjoy it. And I said to Toby, if you do nothing else in your life, if you're just a radio presenter, you will have a very, very nice life and a very nice time. You'll meet all your heroes. You'll get paid a reasonable amount of money if, you, if you're very lucky, a lot of money. And you'll, you'll meet a lot of very nice people. And it's a much nicer world, radio, than television. Television is much more, 
not so much from me, but there was a lot of, you know, backbiting and, and, and stuff. Whereas most radio people get on really well. You know, I always got on very well with, I eventually got on well with, with Evans. I, I have a lot of time for Evans now. I didn't, I didn't earlier on because we were like, like that. Um, Terry Wogan and I, Terry was one of the, one of the funniest men, gentlest men I've ever met. Um, and he's, he's missed with huge sadness by the whole radio fraternity. He was such, do you know when you listen to people on the radio, I think, it's one of my many theories, I think you can tell on the radio if someone's a fake. You can fake it, I think, quite a lot on game shows. The Americans certainly do. You get real smarmy hosts. You think, I bet he's horrible behind the scenes. Um, and they usually are. On the radio, I remember listening to Kenny Everett, and I remember thinking, I'd love to meet that bloke. I, really, I bet he's lovely and really silly, which, of course, he was, and, you know, bless him. And Terry, I just thought, what a great voice. What a, what a wonderful, silly sense of humour for a grown man. And I bet he's a really nice guy. I don't think you can hide on the radio because you just talk so, like I do, you talk so much for so long, day after day after day. And people remember things you said 10 years ago and go, yeah, but he said that, you know, and I, I've never forgiven him for that. I mean, speech radio, talk radio is quite interesting because um, people will last longer listening to talk stations than they do music stations. They're, you know, oh, I'm busy, I've got to get to work, got to, you know, got to park my car, whatever. The boss is in a bad mood. So they will they will park up and, you know, and, and, and go to work. Talk radio, they tend to hang on. My dear old ex-father, well, my, my late father-in-law, bless him, was a lovely old boy. And he listened to Brian, what was he called? Brian oh. Hayes on LBC every morning without fail between, I think, nine and 12, because he absolutely hated it. And he, just, he couldn't he couldn't stop it. He went, did, did you hear what he said today? And I go, no, I didn't actually. But he said, I've a good mind to go down. And I'm going to hit him with my stick. And I went, well, there's no point you're going to hit him with your stick because also it's one o'clock and he's probably gone home. And also you'd be arrested. And also you're 94. So you really can't do that. And he listened to it again the next day. And he was even worse this morning. But he listened every day. Um, radio is a lovely, lovely land. I, and we did lots of things, lots of ridiculous things you know around the years we were a good gang and i still socially see more of the capital lot i see some of the tisworth guys you know over the years we we, we meet we meet having a big reunion next year um and we get on great we get on really well because it's so many memories but the but, and obviously millionaire but the but the capital radio lot are, are still my closest mates if you like the ones i see long after i left when you moved on from radio and you hosted tarrant on tv so oh yes, all those rude films. Yeah, it was just um, looking at television around the world, really. Um, I mean, some of the stuff that they did, well, obviously the Japanese were, you know, because Clive James started it and then I took over from Clive. Um, and it was just looking at funny foreigners. I mean, some of the stuff was, some of it was extraordinary. Um, some of it was truly you can't really do that because that is so cruel and dangerous and somebody's going to die. I mean, that was the Japanese stuff, particularly. And some of it was just like, oh, that is sick. And I don't think now, looking back, however much television has changed and however much the boundaries have widened, there's still some stuff that I can remember now, looking back on stuff we looked at from, from the Philippines and from Holland or whatever you think, we would still not run that, even on you know reality tele television at one o'clock in the morning, whatever. I mean, the Japanese were just, the thing about the Japanese, most, most hosts, hosts, most hosts around the world will, even if they don't like the contestant, they will, and when they lose, they'll go, oh, what a shame. Oh, well, you know, never mind. The Japanese don't do any of that. They go, ah, off you go, goodbye, ha ha, idiot. I mean, they are just extraordinary. They scream abuse at the contestants and make no, pretense of the fact they absolutely, absolutely hate and despise them. And on Millionaire, Frank Skinner showed me this, on Millionaire, you know I do that sort of pause and I go, Morris, it's the wrong answer, or the right answer, whatever. Frank showed me the Japanese host. Now the Japanese would like to do, the Japanese being the Japanese would like to do it very differently. They would like to do it with snakes, down, snakes going down the contestants' Y fronts and electrodes being applied to their testicles or whatever, whatever. They can't do that. Sell it all the makers say, if you want to buy a millionaire, you will make it exactly the same 
as the UK version with Tarrant because that's the one that works best. You must make it in this way. If not, you can't have it because they are the program makers. They went through years of, you know, of pro producing it and planning it and fine tuning it or whatever. So they know that for this to last the longest in every single country, a millionaire, don't forget, sold to 120 countries around the world. For it, to, for it to last, you know, hopefully for three, five, ten years or whatever, you do it this way, and that's the way it goes the longest. So the Japanese host, I'm back to him, the Japanese host, um, he does the same as me. So he'll go, Morris, And he will, now I've done 10 seconds. That's a long time, isn't it? He will do it, I promise you, for about a minute. <laughs> and he go, and the contestants are going, oh, oh. and eventually go, his right answer! Ah! It's just, it's one of the funniest clips I've ever seen this guy. So that's the, that's the cruelest thing you can do. When they get it wrong, he's just, all his Christmases have come at once. Well, yes. that's, a great, that's a great lead then to get us. I was trying to remember what question that was in answer to. I do wander off, sorry. That was your Tarrant on TV question. But now yeah. we've, got to, we've got to move it on. And uh, it's time to start asking you about perhaps your most famous role to date being Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Uh -huh. I want to go right back to when the idea for the show was, uh, was first conceived and how it launched. Now, if you're not sure, if you want to phone a friend or you no. want to get a now, you know, it's, it's something like four or five years since I left. I did, what did I do? 670, you'll know. I did something like 670 shows. Um, I had a fantastic time. I did 15 years of my life. And even this morning when I went down to my local petrol station, and you're now the second one today, a bloke went, oh, Chris, find a friend. And they nearly always go bright red. Oh, my God, he's probably heard that a time or two. I hear it every day, um, every day of my life since 19, whenever we started. Well, I need to take half my script out now. Well, I'm sorry, but uh, it's quite extraordinary. Um, and all those, um, all those catchphrases, like, obviously, want to phone a friend. Um, we don't want to give you that. Go 50-50, uh, ask the audience. They become a sort of internet, not just national, but international parlance. So they, they've used them in the Senate. They use them all in Australia. They use them all over the world. Um, you even get people who, who shout at me things like, when they haven't quite got it right. So they go, oh, Chris, you're going to phone the audience. How the hell would that work? Um, my, the only, and I, I really, people say, you must get better. It just, it, it doesn't bother me at all. It means, and people used to shout things at me about Tears Wars and Capital Radio, whatever. So for me, it's just, you know, the next development. And it kind of means, hello, mate, we like the show or whatever. So I never mind it. Um, Where was the but, show recorded? Well, there was one, I was just going to tell, there was one a couple of years after we'd started. It was one of those really hot, baking hot summer days we get occasionally. I was in Leicester and I was gagging for a beer lunchtime. And I don't usually go into sort of crowded pubs where I don't know because people do double takes and things. So I thought, I've got to have a beer, I don't care. <clears throat> and I walked in. And a few people sort of turned and gave me strange looks and things. The landlord didn't even look up and I said, find a life, please, whatever, find a bit. Um, <clears throat> so he starts pouring out this pint of bitter very slowly. And you know when you desperately want a beer and the tongue's hanging out and it's so hot. And, and he got right up to the top with the, the lovely frothy top and all that. And he got it to there and I, I'm just about to go. And he went, we don't want to give you that. And poured it in the slot bucket. <laughs> <coughs> excuse me i'm coughing <coughs> and poured it in a slot bucket i um yes I, I wasn't too pleased about that he did in fairness pour me another one he gave me one for free and we ended up having a very silly afternoon with all the people in the pub but um no mainly i don't bother all that that stuff doesn't bother me it's a bit silly now because i left but it doesn't matter yeah but it's, it's uh, had it for years it's credit to you that you're thought of still like this yeah it's fine i mean it really doesn't bother me but do you recall how many winners there were of the jackpot during your tenure? Uh, the millionaires, there were, I think there were six, but one of them was a crook. Yes. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yes. So there, were five, there were five honest ones and a dodgy one. I mean, uh, we, we, we need to very briefly talk about um, uh, that gentleman um, and a little bit of a scandal. Uh, were you suspicious? Uh, that no, wasn't quite not right? at all. Um, I've always said that I put my hands up quite openly. Um, no, I just thought he was the most extraordinary man, ever so mad, you know, really 
going for it. He kept saying, no, I don't know, but come on, let's play, crash and burn, crash and burn, all this stuff. Um, I mean, I think we were very naive because we never expected anybody. Mm. And bear in mind, all the contestants were that great big close up as well. Certainly not a serving British Army major. We didn't expect anybody to come on and cheat. So we, did, we would just say to people, can you all make sure you turn your, your mobile phones off? Now, you don't check it. So anybody can leave their mobile phone on. Now, if they sit in certain parts of the studio, in the darker corners, you can have your phone on. Now, you know, you could sit wherever you want to be. You could be in, you know, Holland, and you could hear the feed from my phone coming to you the other end. Um, so it, I, I went up to the box afterwards, and, and I was going, great, another, you know, another great million pound winner. And they went, no, no, I'm not sure about him. I said, oh, come on. I said, no, there's something wrong. And what happened... Um, I went home after the show. The major disappeared. Normally, million pound winners buy everybody a drink. Him and his wife. I mean, him and his wife, having just won a million quid, um, had this massive row in the dressing room. Now, my manager was outside. One of our researchers was outside, and one of the um, makeup girls was outside. And they all say it was too embarrassing to sort of listen. I wish they had, you know, one of those things with a bottle to the ear, um, bottle to the wall. So they never listened properly. So we don't know what was said, but. I don't know, we, we've always, the coppers always thought, and I think they're probably right, that they were having a massive row because she told him, you have gone too far. If you had cut and run at about 125,000 or something, probably they wouldn't look into it. You know, you could blow the whole thing, maybe for several, because uh, the wife, uh, Diana, and also her brother-in-law have both already been on. They both had won 32,000. Whether they cheated or not, we do not know. But, but the major had a lot of peer pressure to get at least 32,000. I mean, in rehearsal, he was all over the place. He really knew very little. So we thought he's got no chance this boat. And slowly, I mean, I think at the end of the first day, he had 4,000 pounds, I think, or maybe 2,000. But he had one lifeline left. Now, that is not the stuff of million pound winners at all. Most of them get to about, you know, 250,000 before they even pause for breath and need a lifeline. Um, he just didn't fit any of the patterns. After the show, so I went home. Um, after the show, the, I mean, Briggs, David Briggs, my mate, the producer, I mean, he also had no idea anything, anything was going on. Because the studio itself is always loud. People are always coughing. But with the major show, they were screaming like, oh, my God, what's he going to do now? Oh, God, he's going to risk it. Oh, is he mad? I mean, people, it's a huge. It was one of the most extraordinary television programmes. Maybe the most extraordinary television programme I've ever done. Um, so I went home, but what happened during the night was that uh, Paul, who owned the company, and several others of the production company, uh, and one young editor sat in going through the tape. They went through the whole thing once, and they're all going, he's doing something. He's, it, it's, how's he getting there? It's, it doesn't make sense. One question maybe all the way through, this is ridiculous. They then ran it through again. And by now, you're talking about two o'clock in the morning. They ran it through again, and about something like quarter to two, a young editor goes, there's a cough there. <laughs> and they go, what are you talking about? I said, there's a cough. And they, go, what? and they said, just stop it. Just go back a bit and play it. So cough, cough, answer, final answer, whatever. And they're going, oh my God. And then they went back to like question four or five, way back before all that stuff about top loader and you know all that stuff. And we're going, and all the way through. What it is, I mean, it's very simple. You go, uh, which of these is the capital of France? Is it Paris? Is it um, Oslo? Is it Helsinki? Or is it Swindon? So you go, oh, I don't know. It, it, no, it could, oh, it could, be, could be Swindon. No, not Swindon. Oh. I, think it, I think it's probably Helsinki. Uh, Helsinki? No, it's not Helsinki. Uh, oh, I don't know. It could, could be Oslo. Oh, could be Paris. <laughs> Paris, final answer. That's actually what it did all the way through. There's one question, for some reason, whatever it was they were doing went wrong. And the, it's the wife who suddenly talked. Ah! But it's like, oh, my God, the information somehow had not come back. So we don't know how they did it. But, I mean, I watched that very good drama last year, the quiz programme. Yeah, it's quite something. Yeah. Um, it's very, very good. It's quite weird watching, watching yourself played by somebody. It's quite weird. He did all this. He did some very strange body movements that I do, which I didn't really. The voice is quite good. It's not. It's not that sort of silly. I mean, all the impressionists like Rory Brennan and Co. Go, Hello, ah, Chris Tarrant here. Tea. I've never gone tea in my life. 
But Michael Sheen, he was doing the something I do when I'm holding a contestant. And I'm, I do something like a sort of, I can't explain it, like a sort of demented duck. And I'm watching this thing, oh my God. And I said to my missus, do I do that? She said, yes, you do that every time. And how I get into that seat was a sort of backwards Fosbury flop. It's very strange. Um, but they more or less suggested in that programme that the major was not guilty. Now, what they did, I mean, I knew them very well. I knew the guys making it. We had long conversations. I wrote a couple of articles saying, don't care what they say, he's guilty of sin sort of thing, uh, which I still believe. Um, and in the end, it's, you know, he was found guilty by the court, et cetera, et cetera. But I think that one of the things they did, which was naughty, was that wonderful Helen McCrory, the late, sadly, Helen McCrory, who, who played the defence counsel. She did a brilliant sum up for the defence, saying, therefore, you must find them, all three of them not guilty or whatever. There was in the play, in, in the play when I saw it in Chichester and in the, in the drama when I saw it on television, there was no prosecution sum up at all. No court ever does that. No court would do that. It's nonsense. It's completely, you know, unbalancing completely. Um, and I do remember from the actual, the actual, the real trial of the major and, and his wife and, and Tech win the coffer. Um, there was a brilliant prosecution sum up and he, he pulled all the strings together, all the various coincidences and things that had happened and, and, and you know, whatever. The major's constant phone calls to Techwin that he refused to admit to, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, therefore, you must find all three of them guilty. And the jury did. And I thought it was naughty that they didn't do a prosecution sum up. In the end, you know, they, they got their comeuppance. There's some talk about them appealing. Well, OK, go ahead, appeal. But there'll be no new evidence. It's nearly 20 years ago. Well, let's talk now about the, the first real winner and the lovely lady, Judith Keppel. Mm. Uh, what was the tension like in the studio then with her? Well, none at all for a while because she's so laid back. Mm. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Was that, I, um, was that a cough? Yeah, no, that, it was not an answer. And it's not a COVID cough, don't worry. I'm, I'm, I've, I've had my boosters and whatever. I've just got a cold. Um, she was so calm and so... I mean, she even when she won the million, she actually said, oh, gosh, crikey. It, um, you know, whereas her, her daughter in the audience was going, oh, that's great, mommy crying and all that. She was just slightly above it all. Um, lovely lady. And obviously, I spent a lot of time with her doing publicity after the event and all that. She said a very odd thing to me, which I've reminded her of several times. In rehearsal, we used to do a quick run through in the afternoon. I sit in the chair and chat a couple of questions and things to look out for, how do you use your life plans, that's where the audience are, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and she, she suddenly said to me, when we finished, she said, um, can I ask you a question? She said, sure, you know, we're, we're not on for another hour. She said, well, do you stop the show at all? And I said, yeah, we stop it. We, we sort of do a break about the length. If we're recording, if we're live, we're live. But if we're recording it, we, we do a commercial break, say it's gonna be three minutes, we do a three minute pause. And apart from that, one or two pickups, if the, you know, sort of, Thing with a funny question coming up or something it's pretty much runs to normal time um why is that she said well what would happen if i faint and i said well i suppose if you fainted and you were unconscious at my feet and couldn't really answer any questions yes we probably would stop you know because it wouldn't be much of a show i said do you have a problem with fainting she said, no no not at all and wandered off <laughs> what a weird woman and you know 24 hours later i'm handing her a check for a million quid she's She's so calm. I mean, she told me that um, last time I chatted to her, she said people still come up to her and touch her for good luck, which is quite sweet. I mean, in this day and age, well, you have to be careful. They get banged up. You can't go around touching, touching ladies for good luck. But I thought it was rather sweet. She's a lovely girl. And now she's on eggheads and, you know, it sort of changed, it completely changed her life. Well, I don't know whether you know, but um, actually she is the third cousin of Camilla Parker Bowles. And she can trace her ancestry back to the royal family, which just happened to be the jackpot question that it was about. Uh, do you remember the question and the answer? No, but it's something about uh, Henry II. And her, her uh, links to the royals are not actually back to Henry II. That's a long time back. There's something like, I think they're Stuarts. They're back to sort of the Cavalier King or something. That's, so it's... I've, I've read that before in the sun. It's as if we sort of, we gave her a question to fit in with, and we never did that. You know, okay, well, let's, 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 if we can, let's see if we can get the question up here. Ah, 
which king was married to Eleanor of Aquitaine? Was it A, Henry I, B, Henry II, C, Richard I, or D, Henry V? Okay, Chris, your final answer is? Uh, I think I'm gonna take the 500 grand. Thank you, Chris, and go home. <laughs> I think it's Henry II. Chris, tell you know, you're all right. Oh, you're yeah. supposed to go, it's right answer, ho! Oh! <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you a funny thing. You know that the point where you ask someone a million pound question, which I, I probably did about 12 times. Quite often they say, I'm going to take the money and go, but you, you would show them the question. Now, because what you say is you've, got, you've done incredibly well, you've got 500,000 pounds. If you play the next question um, and you get it right, you win a million pounds, be fantastic. If you go, you don't have to play this question and walk away with 500,000 pounds. If you play this question and get it wrong, you lose 450,000 pounds. And everybody I've said that to, which is, I say, about a dozen contestants over the years, you see their face go, oh my God. Because they in their head, they've got 500,000 pounds. And you go, well, you have. If you walk away, you could still actually lose nearly all of it. And whether you're Branson or Paul McCartney, or whatever, Losing £450,000 is like, you know, a serious night out. And the only one who went, yeah, OK, fine, let's get on, let's play. Guess who that was? The Major. The Major. Because he knew, he, he didn't, it was only hindsight, about six months later, I was driving along thinking about it. He never even blinked. He went, yes, I know, OK, play. Because he knew he was going to play, and he knew he was going to get the right answer, and he knew he was going to win a million pounds. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately for him, on the Thursday, we stopped the cheque. Well, The Millionaire Show actually became one of the most significant shows in British popular culture. You ranked a formidable 23rd in the 100 greatest British television programmes. And during your tenure, you hosted 592 episodes over 30 series. Did I really? No wonder I looked knackered. OK, now I want to talk, <laughs> now I want to talk about one of your other passions. And that oh, yeah. is fishing. Oh, yes. Touch very briefly on it. Um, such is your love of fishing. Ooh. Yes, uh, that's, you on, that, that's you in the background. Yeah. Uh, you, did, you did a programme called Tarrant on Fishing. Oh, yeah. And one episode I fondly recall is with you and a certain England and Arsenal goalkeeper who's a king fisherman. David. Yes. Now, I yeah. want to know, is he as good at fishing as he was at saving goals? Uh, sickeningly, he is actually. He's he's a very keen, like me. He's quite noisy and you know loud and whatever when he's when he's doing his business. He's he's a very quiet guy a lot of the time. He's good fun. I played cricket with him in the summer. But he's yes, he's a very good fisherman, very keen. Um, he used to have a river right at the end of his garden, like I did at one time, um, and literally fish from the end of his garden. Sadly, most of the fish at the end of his garden have disappeared. And he's a bit fed up these days, but no, he's lovely, David. He did a thing on television once, a sort of sort of charity auction thing, and they were trying to get him. You remember that awful pigtail he had? Yeah, dreadful thing. I was all right on a kid. He's like a grown forty-year-old man. He still had this silly pigtail, and they were saying, "Okay," and people are bidding for David to cut off his pigtail. He's going, "Oh no, I don't want to. I don't want to cut my pigtail off." And it was like one hundred and fifty pounds. Oh no, two hundred pounds. No, no, it's not worth it. All that. And then I forget the program. Well, it was a sort of telethon thing. And then suddenly this figure came up. <laughs> Somebody's just bid two thousand pounds, David, for you to cut off your pigtail. And he went, "Oh God, I've got to do it now. Two thousand pounds for the kids' charity. Oh God, do you know who it is?" And he said, "Yes, it's a Mr. Tarrant from Barclay." He went, "Are you swearing?" And he cut it off there and then on television. Yes. He does look a lot better. That was a silly thing. Yeah, he does. Very uh, nice man, David. Good. You've chat. also written a large number of books. And uh, there's a few just coming up on the screen. And I just want to know really where your inspiration comes from. Oh, God. There's, well, yeah, but um, just my life, really. Um, now, tearing off the record is quite an old one, but it was, it was at the time it was about oh, my sort of early memories of, you know, doing the radio myself and particularly when I went to America, what it was like doing American radio shows and how, how manic all the guys over there were. Um, Tarrant on Top of the World was when I, I went out, I was desperate to see, I'm obsessed with bears, I love bears, I've, I've filmed a lot of grizzly bears in Canada and Alaska, I'd never seen a polar bear, so 
I had to finance the film myself, which was a bit of a gamble. Um, it was all right in the end. I actually placed it on ITV on Christmas Day. But it was basically me filming, trying to find polar bears to film, because although they're great, big, beautiful creatures, they're incredibly shy. So if you, like, we had to take up a helicopter to get anywhere near them, they were just disappearing, so it's quite frustrating. Incidentally, the one in the middle, I don't know what the middle one was called, something about kids don't cry. Nothing to do with me whatsoever. Name it's it. probably a very nice book, but I've never heard of it. Big Kids Don't Cry. Well, that's obviously not me. Looks a bit like Rio Ferdinand. It's Chris J. A. Tarrant, bless him. Yes. That's okay. not me. Oh, well, I can only apologise. No, it's probably a very good book. You ought to buy it. I don't know what it is. Well, but, I mean, the one I'm proudest of, I, I talked about it earlier, was about my dad, which yeah. I wrote after dad well, had died. Let's go on to that one, actually. Okay. Um, about about your dad. Um, just before you do, just very briefly, because I, I know you did that wonderful series, uh, Tarrant's Extreme Railways. I mean, you you literally, you travelled the world with this, and it's just so many places. Yeah, but, um, I mean, the great set, I mean, I loved it, because yeah. I, was one, still doing, I was still doing Millionaire when they came to me and said, look, we, we, we want to do a railway series around the world. Um, you know, would you be up for it? I said, I'd love to, actually, because I love... You see, I'm not a train nut. I don't get particularly excited about trains. Um, you know, I'm not a train spotter, but I, I love railways. I love the way railways have opened up the world, mainly British built as well, back in the sort of 18, 1850s or whatever. We built most of the great railways of the world. And without those railways, most people would live and die within, you know, five miles of their home. So they opened up, I mean, India, when we did the, the uh, monsoon line down there, without the railway there, people would just be stuck in that one-eyed weird part of India forever. Australia, the GAN line completely opened up the whole middle. You know, Alaska, Australia, Bolivia. I mean, we've been literally, we, somebody worked out, we've done it something like, we've been nine times around the globe. I mean, I loved it. I mean, we had a few a few scares and so on. We, we got locked up in prison in Kenya. We thought we were gonna get killed in Zimbabwe. We had a near helicopter crash in the Alaskans, um, in the Alaskan Rockies. But apart from that, it was very quiet and smooth. My missus doesn't know the half of what we what we knew. The fact they nearly didn't come home, but I had a great fun. But I mean that it's it's the fact of you know fact of life and the way of the world that we're living in at the moment. But but we were due. Now you think about this March, twenty twenty, we were due to leave for Mo we got all the visas and the tickets and half a script and all that. We were going to Moscow, going on to Mongolia, and ending up in China. And thank the Lord we never went. Um, because somebody sensible in sort of production control went, wait a minute, this Chinese thing doesn't look too clever. I mean, there's no way we could have gone. It would have been terrifying and actually impossible. And we'd have had to struggle even getting out of the country. I mean, thank God. So that would have been that would have been the latest one we've done. Um, but we obviously had another year's filming to do it, and all that stopped. So I don't know actually. I mean, we assumed we would be filming again by now, and we're not. Um, we're talking about filming next year, but I mean, the way things are at the moment, and obviously with the spike in Europe at the moment, with Germany, 65,000 cases, whatever. I mean, all the places we, we would normally go, which is very much Africa, you know, where they're extreme, Australia, obviously not China, South America, you know, I mean, they're no goes. So it's all on hold. Um, somebody said to me the other day, have you retired? I said, I don't know, I actually don't know. I'm sort of getting used to, I mean, I'm still busy doing stuff, but. And I'm writing a book again, but I'm sort of, I'm sort of getting used to not doing a huge amount. I quite like it. I worked like a dog for years of my life. Um, I have a very nice home. I have some lovely kids and grandkids. Uh, a beautiful lady now has been with me now for 15 years. And you know, actually, I mean, considering how how tough on people lockdown, you know, was and can be, we've all got on incredibly well, which which is great. You know, we I've got quite a lot of land here, so I can I can wander about and. You know, we could go for long walks without bumping into other people and stuff. So we're very lucky compared to people living all on their own in some more flat somewhere. It'd be awful. So, you know, we've come through it fairly unscathed. But, I mean, obviously I've been pretty frightened by it like everybody else, but we're just sort of getting on with life now. But I don't think, I can't see me doing railway programs for, for a long time, if at all, which is Can a shame. Just, just to talk very briefly, I really mean it to keep it brief now. Um, you had that horrific flight coming back from Bangkok, I think. Mm. Can you just very briefly share with us a little bit about that? Oh yeah. Um, basically, I come. I'd flown from Bolivia. Hadn't been home. I don't think at all. Went straight on to Burma, Myanmar. Went on to Bangkok. 
started to fly back, uh, fly back to UK. And I spoke to my missus in the morning, said, hi, darling, love you. I'll see you tonight. She said, yeah, see you at the airport, whatever. Um, and I, as I was getting on the plane, I just remember I slipped a bit and I thought, oh, what's that? And I actually thought, oh, God, I've got cramp and I'm, I'm obviously fairly knackered and whatever. So it was all right. And I got on the plane and whatever. And then when I got on the plane, it happened again. And then again, it cleared up. Just sort of suddenly I found this side of my body was sort of, my arm was down. I, I still kept thinking it's cramp, it's cramp, it's cramp. And it was dark and we were flying through the night and everybody around me was asleep. And then I thought, I slowly, because I'm, I'm, I'm a simple soul, I slowly thought, I think I'm having a stroke. Now this sounds pathetic because there's something very British about most of us who go, I don't want to make a fuss. I don't want to tell anybody. I mean, all the girls on the plane, most of them were sort of sleeping in there a little bit. They're only two wandering about. They spoke very poor English. And I, I mean, I've seen those films where, you know, they, they said, put this, put this plane down and is there a doctor in the house and all this. I mean, if you look at the map from Bangkok to London, where would you want to be put down? You know, um, Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, which one would you choose? I just wanted to get home. I mean, there was a period when I thought, because it kept, it kept coming and going. It would, it would go for half an hour, then it would come again. I'd almost be, well, I was paralyzed, and then it would come again. Um, and I just wanted desperately to get to London, probably just go and see my local doctor, but actually, you know, obviously eventually go to hospital. Um, and when I finally got out of the plane at Heathrow, um, I just sort of picked up my bag and then keeled over altogether. And a paramedic came racing. Heathrow were fantastic. I mean, I was scared, I was very frightened. And Heathrow were fantastic. A par paramedic arrived, two police officers arrived, lovely girl said, you know, anybody waiting for me? Yes, my wife and, and my driver. Don't worry, we'll go and tell them. We won't alarm them, but we'll say, you know, meet you at Charing Cross Hospital. And we just thought, put me in an ambulance and raced me in the hospital. Um, and I spent a pretty scary 24 hours or so. I remember I didn't, I was absolutely exhausted and very battered, but I thought, I will not go to sleep. I do not, I just had this thing that, I don't know, sometimes with a stroke, there's a second stroke, there's the really big one. And I thought, you know, I don't want to die in my sleep. I was very frightened. Um, and they pumped me full of stuff, whatever. Then the next day, slowly disarm, started to lift and then go down and then lift again, whatever. And they were wonderful. And I was out within about, I was very lucky. I mean, I see a lot of strokes of life. So I was very lucky, but you know, I did all my physio and I was back at work in about six weeks, no, 10 weeks. <laughs> Let's talk about something a bit happier. Yeah. Um, and that is music, which is absolutely my specialist subject. Now yeah. I know that you are a huge fan of these guys. Yes. Okay. Yes. You followed them on oh, their forever. drop. Yeah. And, and I know that must have been fun. And I know you've got two model guitars behind you of Telecasters. Yes, I have. Yeah, I want to know, what is your favourite Quo track? Oh, um, probably uh, Rocking All Over the World. Oh, yes. Well, because that was our theme tune. When we, when we did lots and lots of outside broadcasts, yeah. uh, we had a jingle made, Tarrant All Over the World, or wherever, hello, good morning from Hawaii or wherever we were, you know. Australia, we, we did shows from all over the world, and that became our sort of theme. I mean, the great sadness yeah. there is yeah. that Parfit died on Christmas Eve a couple of years ago. One of my favorite, awful. one of my favorite pieces to ever play when I was in the band, absolutely. Yeah. Now, speaking of rock gods, uh, I came across this image of you uh, with another band called The Rockers. Good grief! Oh, this is when we set up a we set up a band one afternoon, didn't we? Yeah, it was now, lost afternoon. Who is in that band? Well, that's Chaz Hodges, isn't it? It is Chaz Hodges, yeah. From we had Chaz. Yeah. I'm not sure who that lady is. She's very nice. I don't know if she's in the band. I just sort of. Sure it's a lady. We had um, Phil Lynott from yeah. Thin Lizzy. Yeah. We had Chaz. Yeah. <coughs> well, we definitely had Roy Wood. Yeah. And I can't remember the others, but it was it was yeah. a brilliant lost afternoon. Indeed. And we've got rock gods in the audience tonight, uh, because I do know for a fact we've got one of the best bass guitarists of all time, who was with Badfinger, one of the original creators. Oh, yeah. Of we've also got a fantastic bass guitarist, Alan Cohen, and he was from the Brickets, still is. And we've got a terrific UK soul singer called Chuck Steak. Um, so in respect of that, I want to move on now to cricket. Um, 
I just love it. I've just always done it. You know, I've, I've been all over the world watching it. Where's that? Oh, that's with Parky, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, well, that's Lord's Taverners, which is my favourite charity. Uh, we raise lots of money for kids with, you know, special needs, poor little loves. Um, rather like you, really, giving giving kids a second chance at life who've had the worst possible start. That's yeah. me with dear old Nicola, the late Nicholas Parsons. Yes. Yeah. Who was absolutely... I mean, how that guy did just a minute, year after year, week after week after week, he was something like... Well, I, I hosted his 90th birthday, and I think he was about 92, and he was still on the radio, dealing with the sharp wits of people like Paul Merton and Graham Norton and Co. Absolutely. Incredible man. Absolutely. Dear Park, you still around. Yeah. Now, listen, I've got to move it on a bit. I, and I've got to absolutely have to talk about your father because I've got to talk about this book because I, I've read quite a bit on this and I am fascinated by this story. Um, it's it's a story about, about my dad. I mean, he was my best friend, you know, my closest friend. And I still miss him every day, really. Um, he fought from 1939 to 1945. He was an infantryman, so he fought, you know, he was at... My mum didn't even know he was at Dunkirk. And I said, Mum, he was at Dunkirk. He was one of the last ones off the beach. He never told her, any, I mean, she was then his fiance, I suppose, to his wife. Never told him, whether he told her, I'll just go around to France, darling, I won't be long. You know, put the kettle on. Um, he, was at Dun, he was at Dunkirk. Uh, he obviously then did, you know, the various manoeuvres and things where they, they rebuilt the whole army. He then went back on D-Day. I mean, some of the stories, the harrowing stories of what happened around him on D-Day, and none of it. He ever told me and then he moved right on through once they once they got the beachhead in in, in um you know along in normandy and they they finally um taken over Khan, which which resisted like mad and lots and lots of people were lost in that they then marched through the whole of that long hot very hot summer july august they marched through france and on into belgium where they got a hero's welcome and then eventually over the rhine into germany um and I, I interviewed several guys who fought with Dad. Um, sadly, only one of them is still alive, but at the time to get my research from various war museums, whatever. And I also talked to the old soldiers. And they said the one thing they all remember, they talk about the stench and going through France after everything they'd seen on the beaches and fighting their way past, stepping over dead Canadians and their dead mates around them and, and whatever, dead Germans, obviously. They said the smell for that three month march they were marching and marching and marching, covered in, you know, all sorts of mosquito bites and sweat and carrying lots and lots of guns and, and heavy ammunition, whatever. But they said just the smell everywhere in the heat of dead men, dead women, uh, diesel, stench of diesel everywhere, and dead animals. They said the stench of, you know, dying cattle and pigs and cats and people's dogs and, you know, whatever. Said it was just awful. This guy said to me, every time I think about that stench, I cry. And that's, you know, 50, 60 years later. Um, so I pieced together just about everything I could find out about, about the war, about my dad. Um, I, I mean, it sold a lot of copies, but really I just wanted to say to my kids, I wanted, who loved him, because he's the most wonderful granddad, I wanted to say, this is your granddad. And they all ran me up going, oh, thanks for that, Dad. Whoa! They're all crying their eyes out. It, it is a very emotional story because they loved the guy so much and had no real idea what he went through. And he never talked about it. He would not talk about it because I think it was too too raw, too, you know. You, I mean, people always say, oh, you know, we'd understand. We wouldn't understand. I think he opened up to other soldiers who'd been there and they had sort of old soldiers meeting clubs. I think they would do it because they would trust each other because they knew that you'd been through it too. My uncle John served in Burma and several of his friends were taken off to Japanese prisoner war camps or whatever, dad's brother. And he would never, ever talk about it at all because he had seen things that nobody should ever see. Just dreadful things happened to his friends. Um, and, it, and it's just about opening up just, just to us what happened in the life of an amazing man. And then he, I mean, also he came back, he basically just went back to work. You know, he sort of rejoined his job where he left off and slowly built his way up. He became managing director. He was a very good businessman. But I think that generation, I mean, if you said to him, do you want counselling or therapy? Said, Don't be daft. I said to mum once, did dad ever have nightmares? She went, no, your father never had a nightmare in his life. You know, um, It was just the way that generation were. And I think they just, you know, we, we owe them all so much. We do. And don't start me about today's snowflakes because I don't want to get into that conversation. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, 
In 2004, you deservedly received... Is it, is it morning yet? Is it daylight yet? It must be nearly, surely. What time does the sun come your OBE. You received your OBE for services from the Queen, yeah, uh, for services to, ch to charity, uh, particularly for disadvantaged children, uh, which is a, a, a cause close to our hearts here at our Youth Alia Child Rescue. And I think with that, this is a fitting place to conclude our interview. Chris Tarrant, OBE, British icon, author, sportsman, fisherman, DJ, presenter, Reading FC supporter, yes. all-round nice guy. This has been an absolute pleasure to welcome you and our sincere thanks for making this evening truly enjoyable. And with your permission, I'd like to hand back to Dahlia uh, because she's going to host a little bit of our Q&A. Bless you, Morris. Chris, Morris. Thank you so Bless much. Bless you, Morris, and thank you for making me so welcome, mate. Thank you, Morris. Wow, that was <laughs> that was amazing. It's just um, a short chat, wasn't it? Good grief. Just a little chit chat, but I will say nobody has signed signed out yet. So you have kept the audience captive. So oh, well that's done good. you. Yep, you're on a roll. A few years of that. Um, we do have some questions, and more yep. are still coming in. I want to um, say personally that uh, Tiz was was uh, the ultimate rebellion because um, the naughty Jewish children didn't go to synagogue and stayed in and watch Swap Shop, but the really naughty ones stayed home from synagogue and watched Tiz Was. Um, and I want to uh, just acknowledge well, Which that one I, were you? Tiz Was all were the you way. really naughty? You were naughty, weren't you? Terrible, yes. And the Bucket of Water song oh, yeah. was a classic. A classic. It was a classic. And it we was something a, you basically did. Pops. Well, you we want to top of the pops? pops. Yeah, we want to top of the pops because we were racing up the charts. The BBC really didn't want us on because they hated us and they wouldn't let us throw water. So we had the bucket of Christmas tinsel song, which was just pathetic. No. Well, I no. think we're the only band, if that's the word, the four bucketeers, who ever appeared on top of the pops and actually went down about six places. <laughs> supposed to go on up, we went down. I love it. Well, you know, we watched you doing all the things that we wished we could do at home, but we would have got in too much trouble. So there you mm -hmm. go. Um, right, let's get to some questions. Um, a question about millionaire. Mm -hmm. um, do, do you believe that you can judge a book by its cover or were there any contestants who uh, surprised you with their ability to answer questions? Oh, quite a few. I mean, they sort of fit into, over years, I suppose really I did so many of them. I mean, yeah, most people fit into sort of categories. There, there were always the very loud ones who were full of it. Yeah, of course, when, I do, when I'm at home, I always win 250 grand and all that. But all that, a lot of that was bravado when they arrived. And usually by the time they got into the seat and they had a big close up like that, all that went. Um, and they would sort of go back into themselves and usually struggle actually, the cocky ones. Very rarely did, but very rarely did very well. Um, I mean, Keppel was a complete surprise. You know, she was just a very quiet, I mean, quite sort of mousy. I don't mean in appearance, but quite sort of shy, you know, and, and sort of kept saying gosh and crikey. She said crikey a lot. Um, and I say this weird thing about when she asked me what would happen if she fainted. So the fact that I gave her a million pounds the next day was just wonderful. I think a lot of people, I mean, I suppose what I what I did a lot was not want somebody particularly to win. I wanted people to win, of course I did, but there were quite often there were times when I just, please don't lose this sum of money. You know, mm -hmm. I know from what you told me how much this 8,000 pounds say means to you and your family and you know, you're in debt and this and that and the other. Do not get carried away. Do not, do not lose this money. And I, I think I, I kind of I kind of expected it would be a woman who won the first million. We had to go about two years before we got one. I think because women are much more sort of coal and calculating and like, no, I've got a hundred thousand pounds. Why on earth would I go any further? Whereas blokes go, yeah, come on, come on, CT, I'm on a roll, and would lose it. And I think in my head, it was always going to be a woman who won the first million. Not actually, as I say, Keppel at all, but yeah, so you could. You could read people. And also some people, within five minutes, you think, oh, my God, this is a person who knows everything. You know, I remember that Irish guy, Paddy Green. I thought, 
He just knows everything. Because usually if they went out, if the really clever ones went out, it would be about football or Coronation Street. And, and, and they, they, if they use lifelines at all, it'd be early on on those sort of, you know, populist questions. They would then go on and they would actually get better and better as it got harder. They would, they would, they would get better because they're into the sort of their atmosphere. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't miss doing it because, I, you know, I left when I left and we'd all had enough, really. But it was a wonderful time because it, I think because it was just so huge. None of us had. I mean, I remember thinking, I mean, this is quite good. We might get three years out of this, maybe four years. I mean, 15 years later, there I still am. And I just thought this is it is actually the most perfect format. That's why it works all over the world. It works in every language. It, it, you know, it's just it's so simple. And the idea of the answers being up there on the screen, nobody ever did that before. You, there was a thing called the $68 million thing or something. And you just have to go, okay, I feel lucky, ask me the next one. With no clue as to what it was or what it was about or whatever. On Millionaire, every all 15 questions or 12 or whatever, up to a million, the answer is always there on the screen. There's only four choices. So, and nobody ever did that. And it means you can play along at home. You also get... David Briggs, my producer, who produced me on radio as well, he always had this thing about shoutability. So he said, people are sitting in their cars, listening to the radio, going, oh, for God's sake, you're so stupid, or whatever. A millionaire has that shoutability factor more than anything. Okay. I remember I was on Richard and Judy, and Judy said to me, Richard's language, when millionaire on, is appalling. He uses words we didn't even know that daddy used, you know, screaming at contestants. My dad used to say, oh, for God, he's so thick. What's the matter with this? Stupid. Where's he been? And all this. And that's what people do. And they still do it, you know. So it's it is just, it's not because the, the host is particularly clever. It's actually because it's the most simple, like all great ideas, it's a simple, brilliant format. And it's something like, I think now it's 121 countries in the world. It's, it's a monstrous thing. It's wonderful. Do that was my you, short answer, by the way. Do you think you could have won if you were a contestant? Uh, no. No, why not? Because I would get, there are certain areas, uh, well, it depends on what questions you get, of course, but I did I did one with the Daily Mail, and we did it sort of proper, where I had to phone a friend, um, we used some of the journalists as ask the audience, um, and I got 125,000. But I stopped then, I went, no, don't know it. Um, I mean, my, my general knowledge is quite good, and it obviously got better from years of doing that. But there are certain things, and my kids will tell you, anything to do with technology, don't ask dad, because I am a dinosaur, a happy dinosaur. I have yeah. to ask my little three-year-old, how do I do this? How do you do, how do, you do? what do you do? How do you do, do that? Um, anything technical, I'd be useless. Anything to do with soaps, I'd be useless. Anything to do with reality television, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do the answer, even if I knew it. I just would be used to it. <laughs> on principle. Yeah, on principle. <laughs> so, uh, no, I... There would just be areas, and I would just, I know you've got lifelines. I mean, I, yeah, I could win a million. I don't think I would, if I'm honest. Yeah. Okay, Melvin wants you to know you've always been a fave. He's been a, fa a fan since the Capital Radio days, which was a very big deal when it started. And he's asking, do you remember the first record ever played? Uh, yes. I'm not sure if it's the one on breakfast or the first one I played. I remember the first one I played. I think the first one I played on Breakfast was Missing You by John Waite, which is also covered by Tina Turner. But the first I know the first one I ever played because you get this thing, this build up before the vocal comes in. And on this particular record, Stevie wanted. Now we're going back to the days of vinyl, as obviously Melvin does. So on this record, I know uh, I just called to say I love you. It goes, ding, 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 ding. I just called after six seconds. So I went, and here is the fabulous Stevie one that with, I just called to say, I love you. Ding, 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 ding. And after six seconds, he hasn't started singing. And I'm just looking at it going, come on, Stevie, anytime you like, come on, Stevie, Stevie. And what I didn't realize in those days, I'm very stupid, is, is that uh, they also used to have B-sides and some of them did an instrumental B-side. Yeah. So my first ever record ever, ever, ever on Capital Radio was three and a half minutes of Stevie Wonder playing the piano to, I just called to say I love you. And I just let it go. I thought, if I try and take it off, I look a complete burk. I was bright red and embarrassed and my new producer was looking at me like, this man is a cretin and won't last yeah. a week. 
but um, they kept you amazing rather yeah well 17 years later i left but yeah. um i i just remember thinking the thing to do is not panic not look embarrassed and i just sort of went 10 past 7 capital radio here's the next record and prayed to god it was the right way around which it was <laughs> yeah. yeah i've always well, remembered that the big why would they do b-sides so they couldn't be able to make up another song or something yeah good days though good days yeah. i had a critic i've always remembered this when i did the breakfast show um after a week it must have been one of the london papers or probably the standard i suppose and there was a there was a critic saying this puerile nonsense of breakfast this buffoon or whatever will i guarantee he won't be on this radio station more than a month so 17 years later I've just got this vision of him going home on the bus. I'm not a bitter man. I just, oh, whatever. You can say what you like and, you know, you might have been right. But no, he was um, he was wonderfully wrong. Yeah, he said I wouldn't last a month. I lasted 17 years. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, not bad. I probably shouldn't have lasted 17 years, but I did. Can't, can't complain now. It's too late. Uh, Melvin has just uh, uh, written that the first record played on Capital Radio was Bridge Over Troubled Water. Not by you. Oh, Don't not by me. I wasn't there. Yeah. Oh, he didn't ask you? Is that what he asked? <laughs> that is what he asked. Oh, hang on, so he asked me that, but he knows the answer anyway. I know. Uh, maybe yeah, Melvin, he, so you're just going to he make wants to be a quiz show host. Oh, for God's sake. Yeah, Melvin, <laughs> well, you, you can bear one of my suits and the ties. Um, yes, I've no idea. You are right, actually. I didn't think that was the question you asked. And I bet Melvin didn't know about playing the wrong side of Stevie Wonder. There you go. We all <laughs> learned something. Yeah, you see? There you go. Um, and who Alan was, Cohen. Oh, all right, right. Ask him then. Who was the disc jockey who played the first record? Well, let's see if Melvin comes up with an. I answer. think it was I Richard Attenborough. I think it was Richard Attenborough introducing this new station on the airways. That's what I think. Let's see if we get an answer to that. Melvin, what you say? Um, I'm going to zip through a couple here. Alan Cohen says thanks for the Brickets plug. You Ooh, are what? welcome. The plug, okay, okay. Brickets. Yep. Uh, Somebody is asking, are you a poker player? Because you were always poker faced on Millionaire. Was it difficult not to lead the contestants when you knew the answer? No, it was, uh, it was difficult. I, it was something I sort of learned. I sort of I taught myself, I think, from day one. I thought, what I don't want to do at any point is sort of even if I... This is so close to someone. I thought, even if I lift one eyelid, they might yeah. think, oh, all we know, all he thinks is that one. No, I... I quickly developed this sort of gormless look that I kept for the next 20 years or whatever. Um, yeah, no, I always, I would always tell the contestants in rehearsal, please don't look at my face for inspiration because there's nothing coming. And if you think you see a clue, ignore it because I'm really not doing that. I always didn't, you know, and once or twice I thought, no, I, I may have given you a hint there. Don't, I'd almost say, you know, don't necessarily think that's the right answer. You had to word it quite carefully, actually, because sometimes you, they go, oh, B, and they go, no, not necessarily. And then they go, oh, you're saying it's not. And then, no, I'm not saying anything. Just make your mind up. Uh, Melvin's come back to say you are correct. Ah, you see, what have I won, Melvin? How much have I got? It must be a million. It's got to be. Yeah, it, was, it was Richard Attenborough introducing, now for the very first time, Commercial Radio presents Capital Radio, da, 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 and then he introduced Bridge Over Troubled Water. And several years later, here's my Richard Attenborough story, he's the most lovely, funny man. Several years, I'd never met him, and I've been doing the breakfast show there for a couple of years, and I was quite, you know, well-known from Tiswell, notorious or whatever, from OTT. And I went for a wee while one of the records was on, and I stood next to Richard Attenborough, who's one of my heroes from acting and directing, you know, all that stuff. Um, and I smiled at him and he went, uh, how's it going, Kenny? And off he went. <laughs> I thought, well, I've made me mark with him. But I uh, I did take it, when I got to know him better, I did remind him of that every time. I said, oh, for God's sake, oh, don't remind me. Of, I'm so embarrassed and all that. Yeah, it was lovely. I wonder if he ever bumped into Kenny Everett and said, how's it going, Chris? Probably not. But it's always one of my wonderful memories of Dickie, who was the nicest guy, lovely guy, big teddy bear. Always burst into tears all the time. He's lovely. Mm. Amazing man. Um, we have a question from Leslie Cavendish who wants to know, do you still watch Millionaire? No, do you know, I, this is nothing to do with Clarkson at all. I just don't. Yeah. I hardly, I shouldn't say this, but I don't work for them anymore. I hardly watch any ITV. I also watch virtually no BBC. I mean, I watch Sky Sports 
dramas and Netflix. Um, you know, whether, I don't know, whether I ought to watch it, I'd have been, I don't know, why would I? I never, I mean, I did 600 and odd myself. There's 500 and odd proper shows for members of the public, then there were a load more, because if you include all the celebrities, there were about 670 or something. So I, I did all those shows. I think I watched two. I watched about the second one to make sure it was all okay. And I watched one a long time later for some, no reason at all. I think it was just on some. So why would I bother to watch Jeremy, you know? Um, it sounds sort of unkind, and I don't mean it, actually. You know, good luck to him, but I've no interest in it. I was there from the very beginning. I saw this meteoric rise. No one will ever get that away from us. This incredible time when it just went through the world, took over America by storm and Australia and whatever. Um, and I have so many great memories of, of, of the first million pound winner and all that, that I'm not really interested now. You know, I, I feel like, I don't know, did Bob Monkhouse go racing home to watch Vernon Kay or Les Dennis or whatever? I, I don't think so. No. I don't, feel, I don't feel a need to. Anyway, no, I haven't done yet. I may do. Maybe one day. Um, let's finish with a question. Uh, oh, finish. A, I like that word. Yeah, me too, right? You're <laughs> tired. What do you say? Um, no, no, it's about midnight. Go on, it's fun. It, it's midnight tomorrow. Um, a, a question close to my own heart. Uh, let's talk about children's charities. Yeah. Uh, you yourself are quite involved in a number of them and, and uh, you know, it seems to be a cause that's quite close to your heart. Um, what is it about children's charities over over others? I think it's um, it, some of it's a sort of not a guilt thing exactly, but sort of there. But for the grace of God, go I because I've got six very healthy kids and like five now, lovely little bouncy, healthy grandkids, and you go to see lots of other places which I have done. Particularly, I was um, president of Laws Taverners for a couple of years. I'm still a very keen taverner, which is a photo with me and Mike Parkinson and and dear old. Um, Oh, Nicholas. Um, and it's about giving children, very much like the charity you talked about earlier, mm -hmm. it's about giving kids who didn't have the best possible start in life a sort of second chance. Um, we, what we try and do, I mean, lots of things now. I mean, it started by Prince Philip nearly 70 years ago now. Um, but what we try and do amongst other things every year, um, and a lot of it's through cricket and dinners and things. I mean, I've had so many wonderful, silly nights with the taverners all over the country. Um, some of which I hardly remember at all, but um, we try to we try to get well. We decide one of the things we did from the beginning was raise money for minibuses, customised, you know, handicapped kids coaches, uh, which we distribute around the various regions, twenty four regions, uh, tav taverners regions all over UK and Ireland and whatever. Um, and we said about eight years ago now, we said let's get enough money to to literally hand over one of these every single week of the year. And we achieved it that year and we've done it every year since including last year right through the middle of covid and whatever and when you see the sheer joy on the faces of these kids when you feel you do a sort of big number of handing over a big key and you know somebody on behalf of the school accepts it because their whole world is opened up so much with what they can do where they can go what outings they can have the seaside, the zoo, all things that they couldn't do just from their school because they're too ill to do much traveling. So because they're all customized and it, it's really tear jerking, actually. I mean, really emotional. And it is a lot, a lot of this stuff. But you also feel good. You know, I mean, you must do the same. You feel yeah. that was actually worth doing that. So, yeah, I mean, it is. It's giving kids a second chance who did not have the, you know, the best possible start to their lives at all. Um, I'm patron of another one locally called Swings and Smiles which is again, a handicapped kids charity. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not a saint at all. I just think I've had a very nice life, a very lucky life. And you, ought, I really do think you ought to put something back. You know, however you do it is up to the individual, but I think you should. And one of my ways, I'm very good at raising money. I'm very good at beating money out of people in charity <laughs> auctions and things, which I like doing, you know, so, and as I say, if you see, if you see the results and those are very sort of instant cheap results if you like, but it's instant like, oh my God, look at that. Happy little school, you know, from an hour ago when we arrived is, is wonderful. So that's why we do it, because because I've got a whole army of sickeningly healthy, loud children. Bless them. Amazing. Mm. Um, yeah, I think it, it's incredible to think that you impact not only that one child that one day, but the ripple effects just keep going because yeah. because that child's going to have a different path in life. Uh, other children following them will also 
have different opportunities will say, well, if he can get out of this rough neighborhood or out mm. of this terrible situation, I could do that too. And if, if I can see this person becoming, you know, a doctor or a, a graphic designer or whatever, an officer in the army, then maybe it's not out of the question yeah. for me yeah. coming from the same neighborhood. And so, you know, I love the, the ongoing effects and then it yeah. goes to the next generation and the next. Um, well, I think it's, it's very, I mean, it's selfish really, because it's self, you know, aggrandizement, but it makes you feel good. Yeah, I've done something does. good today. I didn't just go out and do a silly television program and earn money. I actually made a difference to these kids' lives. You know, yeah. a lot yeah. of them have the worst possible start. Some of your kids have the worst possible start in life. You know, yeah. Yeah. and as you say, to see them develop to become some sort of professional is an it's a wonderful achievement. It's incredible. Yes, mm. it is incredible. Well, I I will say that seems like the perfect place for us to to let you get on with your. Um, <laughs> dreams uh because we're yeah. not that late thank you so so much for really giving us so much of yourself no, you're very and your well. time um it's been so much fun i you know people have really enjoyed this i know um thank you also to morris and the committee um thank you to everyone who has helped make this happen thank you to all of our guests i would invite you please stay involved uh please remember that we're doing this to uh, raise money for kids. If you would like to make a donation, I'll be sending you out an email um, with a link, go to our website. Also, please, we have a few more events coming up. We've got Alan Titchmarsh joining us on the 13th of December. So that will be a lot of fun too. Uh, in January, we've got two events uh, during the month of Holocaust Memorial Day. We've got Eva Schloss, who is a Holocaust survivor and stepsister to Anne Frank. Uh, who will be talking about her life and her experiences uh, through the Holocaust and her life since as a Holocaust educator. And we also will have author Heather Morris, who wrote the international bestseller, The Tattooist of Auschwitz, has uh, now written a book uh, called Three Sisters, uh, where she uh, tells the story of three sisters and their journey through Auschwitz and coming out the other side. Um, so some incredible events. Please tell your friends, uh, invite everyone to join us. Um, it's been an amazing evening, Chris. Thank you so, thank so you. much. Thank everyone, you so much. And thank you all for making me so welcome. <laughs>